everyone! Welcome back to Comics Crash Course. Thanks for your patience during the hiatus. It's been really busy this summer, so it's been great to get a little bit of time off, as well as to have some time to get ahead before the school year starts. So, in this second series, we're going to talk about comics form. In other words, how comics work. But before we do that, I'd like to get started in this episode by breaking down some of the different roles that are involved in creating a published comic. Well, who makes comics? Why? Well, because you can't have a comics form without comics existing in the first place, and comics can't exist without someone making them. Now, some of you might know all of this, and if so, enjoy your extra week off. However, when I talk to people about making comics, I find a lot of folks are surprised at just how many different roles there are in making a comic book. Sometimes one person takes on all of these roles themselves. Sometimes every single role is handled by a different person. And frankly, both methods are equally impressive. In one, an artist does everything themselves and has to master a wide range of skills. In another, a comic is the product of an insane amount of collaboration between talented creators from across a wide range of disciplines. So, what are these roles? We could start anywhere, but let's start with words, since it's slightly less complicated than the pictures have. So, usually one person is the writer. They plot the story, the overall beats, they write the dialogue and the captions. Now, every so often the job of plotting and dialogue will be split up, especially on big studio books. So one person will come up with the overall arc of the story, the big plot points, and someone else might write the specific dialogue for an issue or story. But for the most part, it's usually the same person. Now, most comics writing looks more like a screenplay than like prose writing. That's because it's easier to indicate to the artist the basic setting of a scene and what kind of dialogue there needs to be in a space in that format than in large blocks of descriptive text. However, one of the frustrating things for new comics writers is that, unlike the TV or movie industry, there's no comics industry standard for how to write a script. So writers who draw their own work sometimes have a rough outline or no script at all. Writers who work with the same artists for long periods of time develop a relationship and might develop shorthand or trust their partner to make choices. Now, some writers are more controlling. They have a distinct vision for every little detail on the panel, and they'll have to write that down. Others give bare descriptions and let the artist make the choices. Most writers probably fall somewhere in between. Now, all of that was about writing the story, but not about visually writing the words. That job goes to a different person entirely, the letterer. It used to all be done by hand. Nowadays, a lot of it's done with computers, but there's still someone who has to do it. Artists will work to develop unique typefaces that look and feel handwritten or reflect a certain character's speech and tone. Then, whether it's on the computer or by hand, the letterer has to make sure that everything fits properly into speech balloons and caption boxes without feeling too cramped or leaving weird pockets of empty space. Letterers often, but not always, end up in charge of sound effects, too. Now that's a whole thing. We'll get into sound effects in another video. So, to pictures. Comics have typically been a form that have been reproduced. And up until recently in the history of publishing, that meant that the only cost-effective way to reproduce art required artists to produce a simplified black and white form of the original art that would be ready for reproduction and sometimes for coloring. Now, pencils don't really produce a clean enough line. So most artists turn to dark, waterproof, permanent inks like India ink, for example, that can stand up to being handled by publishers and machines and create a clear contrast between black and white. Now, as you might guess, artists tend not to work in dark, permanent ink on their first go-round. That means that most artists work in some sort of pencil first. Now, artists sometimes use regular old pencils, but you might also sometimes see blue pencils. See, there's a shade of blue called non-photo blue that isn't detectable by scanners or cameras so there would be no need to erase it after inking. Handy. Now, in comics, especially in the major studio comics industry, it would be quite common to find that one person would pencil a book and another person would ink it. So the main reason for this would be speed. Dividing the job between two people theoretically cuts the time required in half. Instead of having to pencil the page and ink it, you could pencil a page, hand it off to somebody else who could then ink it, while the penciler could then start the next page. Now, in reality, it would never quite cut it in half, but it could free up a popular penciler like, say, Jack Kirby, to work on several books at once. But don't think an inker just traces a penciler's work. At the website whatifkirby.com, you can see artists try their own hand inking from Jack Kirby's pencils. Well, photocopies of them, of course. 
Kirby is a beloved artist, but he rarely inked his own work. That means that people have a lot of opinions about his collaborators and inkers. Now, thanks to work like this site, which has examples from different inkers working on the same page sometimes, it's a little easier to spot the subtle differences that inkers can make, as well as some of the more obvious stylistic choices that they might bring to the table. Now, these days, of course, computer graphics have changed the game. Some artists will physically pencil pages, but scan the page and ink it digitally. And many artists just work entirely digitally. Speaking of digital changing the game, there's color. Now, in the early days of coloring comics, most colorists would create these color key pages from photocopied pages of the inks. The color separation process only allows for four colors, uh, cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. However, these colors can be mixed, and the colors could use films of different thicknesses to determine the saturation of the inks, 25%, 50 or 100%. So this allowed artists to use 64 colors total in comics color printing. That was up until the 1980s when technology developed that raised the number of colors from 64 to around 124, and then in the later 80s from 124 to 372. Now, with digital printing technology, as well as digital color platforms like Photoshop, the number of possible colors printed on the page is practically infinite. This new printing technology allows comic artists to reliably reproduce images of comics from all media, whether it's hand-painted comics, using collage, built from photographs, you name it. Now, those kind of comics might have existed before the 1980s, but they were difficult to print and to reproduce accurately. It's one of the reasons that comics are historically kind of cartoony looking, sort of simplistic. There were just technological limitations on the printing and reproduction process. So one last role I want to talk about, and that's an editor. Now this isn't someone that a lot of people might consider part of the creative team, but it's an essential person to making a good comic work. Now, even in a one-person show, someone who does all of the work on the creative side, a publisher will pair a creator with an editor. When a lot of people hear editor, they think spell checker, but editors are so much more than that. So one of the most important roles of an editor in the creative sense is that they're the first readers of the comic. Now, sometimes one editor will do all the things I'm talking about, but sometimes there are special editors for scripts, for images, for the production help. Editors help creators make sure that all of the com parts of a comic work individually and together, that the pictures read well, that the order of the images and the events of the story make sense, and that the story itself makes sense, that the dialogue reads well, that nothing sticks out as funny or doesn't hit right. And they offer feedback if anything's not clicking. They don't change things themselves, but they tell the creators what they're seeing, and they work with them to make sure that the final product is the best possible version of their comic. Some editors often add editorial notes to help explain historical connections or remind readers of what happened in previous episodes. So while they're not necessarily creators in the same sense as the penciler, the inker, or the writer, they have a huge influence on the final comic that you read. And interestingly, while the mainstream comics industry has been, has been a male-dominated field, there have been a large number of highly influential women who have served as editors at major publishing houses. So while you might not know their names, it's very likely that women like Francois Mouly, Louise Simonson, Diana Schutz, Anne Nascenti, and Karen Berger have helped make some of your favorite comics. So if I were to get into the entirety of the publishing side of comics, I might be here all day. So I'll draw the line at editor for now. Suffice it to say, to make comics, you either have to be a master of many trades or willing to collaborate with a wide range of artists. It's one of the things to me that make comics special. But when it comes to the reading side of comics, your role? Well, forget about all of them. You heard me. I'll tell you why next time. See you then. I hope you've been enjoying Comics Crash Course. If you'd like to help us out, I encourage you to click like, to tell your friends to check out our channel, and as always, to hit subscribe.